Recursive workflows, what are they? How do they work? I think it's helpful to start with an example right out of the gate. Let's just say I've got this table of users, right? I've got these users in my database and I wanna be able to make changes to multiple of these users, the ones that I select, right? I'm selecting all these users and I wanna be able to go, okay, look, I've selected all those users. I now wanna mark all of these users as active. So these users here on the right-hand side are obviously the ones that I am selecting. So I, I wanna make changes to all of those users at once. Well, a recursive workflow is the most powerful way within Bubble for making changes to large lists of things. What we essentially wanna do is something called looping. We wanna loop through this list of users, meaning we wanna go through each of them one by one and make a change to them. And to have that kind of looping logic, we wanna use a recursive workflow. A looping function is the most common use case really for you to um, have what we call a recursive workflow. So just before we get into how to set this up in Bubble, let's get into this a little bit more conceptually. So here I've got in my trusty Miro board, a schema, let's say, of what our recursive workflow looks like, what it's going to do. So try not to take this in all at once. Let's just go through it step by step. So to start with, we have some kind of trigger, some kind of event that's gonna launch this workflow. So for us, that's this button being clicked, right? Mark as active. What we then do is we pass we pass here, see we've got some users here. We pass some users into this workflow. So this is the input to our recursive workflow, is a list of users, right? It's, it's this list here, right? These are the, the users that we wanna make changes to. So we pass that list in, and what we essentially then do is we take one of those users at a time, okay? And we say make changes to that user. So if we're going through that list, we're essentially saying, look, make changes to the next user in that list. If we're just gonna go through them from start to finish, one through 10, however many they are, right? Then we're just gonna look and we're gonna say, okay, who's the next user in that list? Let's make a change to them, okay? So in our case, that's marking this user as active, this one individual user. Then this is where the recursiveness aspect comes in. The workflow, asks itself, are there any more users in this list? Okay, so if we're going through one by one here, if we're going one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera, okay, at six, for example, the answer to that question is yes. Are there more users? Yeah, well, there's, there's at least one more, there's seven, okay? Once we're on this guy, Dolly Houghton, are there more users? Yes, there are, we keep going through. So each time that the answer to that question is yes, are there more users? then we start over, which essentially means we come all the way back to this step. We've make, made change to that user, so he can go, right? Now we grab the next user from this list and we make changes to them, okay? And then we discard them <laughs> and we ask the question again, are there more users? If yes, start over, okay? So here we're, we're looping back on ourselves or where you can think of it as we're looping through this list of users. And each iteration, each loop, we're moving from one user down to the next user, right? Or in your case, it could be anything, products, invoices. We're moving from one item to the next each time we loop through here. And the recursiveness aspect is because the workflow is triggering itself from within the workflow, right? Once we get to this step here, start over, the workflow says, I want to start again, okay? So it triggers itself to start over. That's the recursiveness aspect. That's what recursiveness means. The logic is self-contained, okay? Within this formula, within this expression, this logic contains some component which references the formula itself, okay, which calls it, as it's called in the wider program rule. So we're calling this function over and over and over again. But of course, then that begs the question, well, wouldn't this just go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? But that's where we have an exit condition, 
Or in other words, that's why we have this, are there more users question, okay? Because at some point, once we go through all these users, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 we get down here to Gaylene, who's holding the fort for us as the last user in this list. And once we get to Gaylene, right? So Gaylene, she's this user here. Gaylene, make changes. Okay, cool, thanks Gaylene, you're now active. Now, are there more users? No, there's not. Okay, Gaylene was the last user in that list. And so we come down here, no. And this no might just be nothing. Okay, the workflow might just end here in the, in the sense that it won't trigger itself. Or we have, you know, in the wider programming world, this might be called an exit condition. We have some action that only fires once this whole looping workflow has finished. We're not looping anymore. We sort of come out of the loop. Okay, you've gone round the roller coaster, looping, 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 and now you're pulling into the bay where you have to exit and um, dispose of your of your spew, of your vomit um, in the nearest garbage canister. So that's what a recursive workflow is at a, uh, a high level. How do we get this set up in Bubble? So what I've got, I've got two repeating groups here on the page. This first repeating group here is just doing a search for users. And in this test app that I've got going on, I've got 50 users in the database, okay? Obviously, you know, in, in your app, you'll probably have a lot more data types than this. So a list of users. What's happening when a user, when I rather, click on one of these check boxes, I'm triggering a workflow. I'll just reload this page in step-by-step -step mode so you can see it. So what happens when I click on one of this, these check boxes is I'm triggering a workflow. And there's a condition here. Let's ignore the condition for now. Okay, I'm just gonna click run next. Okay, so cool. So what's happening here when this condition is true, which we'll, we'll get to that condition in a second, but what's happening is this event is adding a user to a second list, okay? To this second repeating group. Okay, so this repeating group here actually doesn't have a data source, but it gets items from this first group pushed into it. So we're essentially creating like a multi-select function. So how that's working, we're displaying a list of users in that second repeating group, which we're calling our selected users. And we're adding, because the repeating group has to take a list as an input. So what we're feeding it is the list of users it already has, Okay, so repeating group selected users, list of users. So the list of users that's already inside of this repeating group, which the first time that we do this will be zero. It will be empty, which we're seeing here, right? Plus item, the parent group's user of that checkbox that we just clicked. That user that we just clicked on over here is now being added to that list. Okay, so if I go run, there we go. There's one added. There's another one added, there's another one added. And to that condition, what I have is, if I click on a user that is already marked as a checkbox, then we're doing the inverse logic. So we're, we're asking, look, does that second list of users here, the selected users, does it contain this user that we just clicked on? Okay, if it does, then I want you to remove that user. So then we're pushing into that repeating group selected users, the list of users that it already has minus that user that we just clicked on. Okay, that's the way that we have to write these expressions in bubble. So then we're removing that, that user. And then I have you know, the inverse condition for adding a user. So we're first looking to see whether that repeating group of selected users contains the user that we just clicked on and there's one event that's going to remove that user if it's already in that list and another event to add that user into that selected users list if it's not already in that list, okay? And then my little checkbox here just has some conditional behavior that's just looking to see is, that, is the user in the cell in that selected users list? Okay, so this is how we're managing the multi-select functionality. We have a master list of users that we're feeding from, that's just pulling users from the database, and then a secondary repeating group just to hold the users that we're selecting. So this is a very common setup that you might have in your own app, this kind of multi-select functionality, okay? But now, how do we actually loop through 
this list of users and make changes to them. That's, that's the meat of what we're talking about here. So we want to click this button, right? This is our trigger event, okay? But then what do we want to happen, okay? So if I go start edit workflow here, there actually isn't any actions that we can choose here on the page that are gonna let us do what we wanna do, okay? We could do make changes to a list of things, right? And feed in of type user, the repeating group selected users list of users, okay? But this is not good practice. We very rarely wanna use this action except on very small lists because bubble will time out it will essentially crash if we feed too many users into this action. It's not designed to hold large lists of users, okay? So what we wanna do instead is this recursive workflow setup. So how do we actually set that up? Well, we have to set that up in something called backend workflows, which maybe you're familiar with already, but to get access to them, we just have to go down here to our settings, API, and then we have to tick enable workflow API and backend workflows. Okay, here we go in backend workflows. Now all a backend workflow is, is a workflow that is going to run on Bubble's own servers or on your app's server. Okay, so all of these actions that we have here living on this page, right, like adding a list to a selected users list, these are actions that are happening, what we call client side. They're happening using the computing power of your actual browser, of your computer, okay? Your browser is, think of it like the machine that's running this code, okay? It has limited computing power. A backend workflow is where we're gonna use the computing power of your app servers. Okay, which are actually run by Amazon, you know, Amazon Web Services that you might have heard of. So these massive warehouses of servers that are in essence just very powerful computers, very powerful machines that have the power to run a lot of very powerful logic that your browser just isn't well set up to do. Okay, so we use backend workflows here because it's the only way that Bubble exposes the ability for us to have a recursive piece of logic, to have some workflow that's going to trigger itself, that's gonna reference itself from within its own set of actions. So if you can imagine, everything within this box here is the recursive workflow, okay? This is like a self-contained program, a self-contained piece of logic. And what it needs to operate is some inputs. So you can think of it like a black box. It, it takes some inputs, right? And then it does some work inside, okay? Common analogy for this is something like ordering pizza, right? The, the pizza shop, pizza store, is gonna take some input from you. What pizzas do you wanna order? And it's gonna take some payment and it might take your delivery address, right? And then it's gonna do some work inside of itself, right? Inside of the program, it's gonna do some work to make those pizzas, to charge your card, to deliver the pizzas. So what we're creating here is a similar kind of module, a piece of functionality that does something and takes in some predefined input. So very similar to an API. If you've worked with APIs, okay, then we're essentially creating like our own API function here that we're calling that we're triggering from within our application. And so it takes some inputs. And one of those inputs that it takes, as we've already discussed here, is this list of users, okay? So this list of users is being passed into the function, right? Into the backend workflow. So to set this up, we first need to define what are the inputs here? What are the inputs? So I'm gonna click here to add a backend workflow. I'm gonna say new API workflow. And then we give it a name. So, you know, we can call this anything. We might call this update user statuses. Okay, and you need to omit any spaces in your name here. Okay, you can't have any spaces. Exposes a public API workflow. Okay, we're not gonna get into this. This would allow other services to trigger this function, to trigger this workflow. We don't want other services to do it. We're just doing it from within our own app logic here. So we can turn that off. 
Okay, and then these other checkboxes as well aren't important for us. What is important for us is down here, add a new parameter. This is where we define the inputs to this function. Okay, so one of those inputs, obviously, is that list of users. Okay, so I'm gonna define here, list of users, and it's a list. Okay, it's a list of users, so I'm gonna tick that box too. Okay, but we do need some other information to make this function as well, right? What I could do here, right, if I add an action to this workflow, right, so this first step here, make changes to the next user. So if I was to add that action, I'd go make changes to thing, thing to change, users. Okay, so now I'm pulling in this list of users and now I've got to just pull out a single user. Okay, so which user, right? The first one, well, that's gonna change just the first user every single time this workflow functions probably, right? So this is where we need some kind of looping functionality. We need the ability to go one by one through each of these users. So the way that we do that is using an index, okay? This is user one, this is user two, this is user three, this is user four. And that means that within our workflow here, if I have that list of users, then I can simply go item number, and then I can pull out the user with that index, okay? So the fourth item in the list, right? Or the fifth item in the list. And so every time that we're triggering this, that index should be incremented by one. That's the way that we're gonna go through each one of these users. So the first time it runs, that index is gonna be one. The second time it's gonna be two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we obviously don't wanna hard code this. We want this to be something that we populate dynamically. And so for us to have access to this piece of information, right, what index are we on? What number loop are we on is another way of looking at this. How many times have we looped through this workflow? What user do we wanna pull out of that list this time? For us to have access to that number, we need to define it as a parameter. Okay, so we're gonna define a parameter here that we're gonna call index, which is gonna be of type number, okay? And now we can simply say, okay, that what item do we wanna pull out of that list? The index, all right? And of course, what thing do we wanna change? Here, we're just gonna change the active to yes, right? That's the thing that we're actually changing here. And for us to complete the picture here, right? We're making changes to the next user, okay, cool then are there more users if there are start over? In bubble speak, right, that's simply an action to call this backend workflow again, right, to trigger it over again, but to have a condition where we're only going to trigger it again if indeed there are more users in that list. Okay, so if we think through how we might formulate that, one way might be to say, okay, well, how many users do we have, right? What's the length of that list? And if the index is less than the value of that total number of users, well, that means that there's still users left that we haven't processed, right? If the index is seven, but the total number of users is eight, then we know that we at least need to loop through this backend workflow one more time. So, Let's add that logic. Let's trigger this backend workflow again. So how are we gonna do that? Is we're gonna schedule an API workflow. This is the way that we trigger backend workflows. And just note, we haven't dealt with this connection yet between the, the trigger button, mark active, and the backend workflow. We're gonna get to that. We're just dealing with the workflow logic itself here. So we're scheduling an API workflow, and now we can choose this workflow again, right? So this is the recursive aspect where we're triggering the workflow that we're already inside of, okay? So recursiveness, that's what that means. Schedule date, we can set that to be the current date or time, the users. So note how we're passing in parameters here, how we're passing in certain parameters to this workflow. Okay, because we're triggering it now. And when we trigger it, we've already told it what the inputs are. And any time that we trigger it, we need to now provide those inputs. So the users, the list of users that we're looping through here, that we're cycling through one by one, that's not gonna change. 
Okay, that's just the same list of users that we already have, that we would have got when we fire this trigger event, which we, which we haven't done yet, we're gonna to get to that. And then the index, well, that's just gonna be whatever the current index is, plus one, right? So that we're cycling from one user in the list now to the second user in the list. And then for this logic, are there more users? That's where we can simply say, okay, well, I actually only want you to re-trigger yourself here now when the index is less than, right, the total count of users. So I could go here, okay, users count, okay, but that means that this count expression, it's gonna have to be calculated, it's gonna have to be retrieved each new time that we're triggering this workflow. So what I like to do is actually just have a parameter here called count that we just get one time, store it as a number, because it's not gonna change, right? This backend workflow is receiving a list of users and that list is finite, it's not gonna change. So we'll, we'll store that as another parameter that we'll define as an input that we'll receive when this workflow starts to run and then we'll just pass that through here now. So this workflow here is now basically complete. We don't have this exit condition yet, but let's complete the picture a little bit more first and connect this button. Okay, so this is where this, this whole cascading event is gonna start, right? This is where we trigger the first domino to fall, so to speak. And then each of the dominoes after that is another user that we're making changes to, but it has to start somewhere, right? There has to be a trigger. And so that's what this button click is gonna do, mark active. So here, what we're gonna do is we're going to come down to custom events, schedule API workflow. So this is how we schedule backend workflows. API workflow, backend workflow, it's the same thing from Bubble's point of view. They're, they're using these terms interchangeably. And here we choose which API workflow we wanna trigger. Well, we only have one, excellent. The schedule date, we want this to just happen now. You know, you might in your app have some other requirement, but for our purposes, we can just start this now. And then now we can define what the initial values for these parameters are. So for users, predictably, right, we wanna take those users that we got here in this second repeating group, this repeating group selected users. So I'm gonna go repeating group, selected users, list of users. The index, well, we're always gonna start at one. No need to complicate that. And then the count, well now we can actually add up how many selected users there are. So again, repeating group, selected users, list of users, count. So now we are starting to fire this workflow on this button click and we're initializing it, we're starting it with these initial values here. So if we come back now to the backend workflow, right, we've done this part, mark active, we're passing in some values here. So we're passing in a list of users, we're passing in an index, right? The index is one and we're passing in a count as well, right? So that count, who knows? Just for the sake of argument, let's say it's 50, right? 50, 50 users in total in that list, okay? Don't know why those arrows are all going down there, but. These are the inputs now to this workflow. And now it's just going to cycle through here. I've obviously written this in, in pseudo code, so to speak, not in the way that we would construct these expressions in bubble, but in natural language, right? This is what we're doing. Make changes to the next user and then asking are there more users and cycling through. So the last part of this is that when we have looped through all these users, we want to fire off a notification to the admin, which you might do in several different ways. For our purposes, we're just going to send ourselves an email, let's say, okay? So if you can imagine, here's the looping function, right? It's being triggered here, making changes to a user, scheduling itself, starting over, make changes, scheduling itself, make changes, scheduling itself. So it's going around and around and around like this until we've exhausted all the users in the list, until the index is equal to the count of users, okay? Because if you can think, we're passing in 50 users here. On user 49, right, when the index is 49, it's still gonna trigger itself. 
the index is less than 50, if we're using 50 in this example as the count of users. So then it's gonna trigger itself once more, but it's also gonna increment the index by one. So now we're at an index of 50. So now we go through, make changes to the user, cool. Okay, now the index 50, is it less than the count of users, which is 50? No, it's not. So this isn't gonna fire, but we can have another event here, another action rather that does fire. So like I said, you might have different mechanisms in your application for notifying your admins or a series of things that happen. You might wanna, from here, schedule another backend workflow that does a num number of different things to notify maybe a number of different admins. All depends on your app setup, but for the sake of argument, right, let's just send ourselves an email, right, recursive app example as the subject line, uh, sorry, subject line down here, That'll, that'll do as well. And in the body, we could just say recursive workflow complete. And if we were wanting to be fancy, we could store here at what time the recursive workflow started. And here we could record what time the recursive workflow ended. And then we could have an indicator of how long it actually took. Because what we're doing here, when we're scheduling this, this recursive workflow is we're offloading the work to your app servers to those bubble servers that I mentioned before. Okay, so that work is now just happening asynchronously, if you will. It's happening independent of what your users are doing within your application. Okay, you've, you've offloaded the work, you've outsourced the work to those bubble servers. Okay, so this is just gonna tell us then when that process has finished. And then of course, at the moment, this send email action is gonna fire every single time that we loop through this workflow, okay? Because we're gonna come over here, check to see whether we're gonna fire it again, and then we're gonna send the email, and then the workflow is gonna end. So what we actually wanna do here is add a condition that's only gonna fire when we're at the end of this loop, right? Which, in other words, when the index is equal to the count of users in that list. And looks like I've actually forgotten to put my, um, my domain there. In my email address, okay, that's all sorted. All right, so now let's actually test this out, shall we? So here I am, let's just grab an arbitrary number of users here, not every single one, but some of them. Okay, so we've got a few users in there now. If I click Mark Active, we should see this field here, which is just set at the moment to, to take whether the users active field is yes or no, and then display active if it's yes, and display inactive if it's no, okay? And remember, right, this is, this is just a Boolean type field, a yes or a no field on a user. So once we click mark active, we should see all these checked ones turn to active and get an email as well at the end. So here we go, and look at that. Look at that. Turn active, let's keep an eye on our email box, boom. Then we get an email saying that our recursive workflow is complete. So that's recursiveness in a nutshell. Just a couple of sort of disclaimers or footnotes. We're doing a pretty lightweight manipulation here to the data, right? The logic is pretty lightweight. We're just changing one field on one object every time that this this loop occurs, okay? But do note that this is taking up some of your app capacity, which you pay for, right? Which if you go down to your logs and you look at capacity, right? You can get a view of what capacity that you're using. And I've just got a stupid test app here, so I'm not using any capacity. But this will go up when your app is doing work, right? When you're running workflows, including these backend workflows. And so you should be careful not to put too much into this workflow. You have to keep an eye on it in your own app, your own needs. What you can do, let's say that you're doing a whole bunch of manipulations here and there's quite a lot of stuff going on. Maybe you've got recursive workflows nested within recursive workflows and that kind of thing. To stop your app timing out, which is essentially when Bubble will say, hey, you know what? You've hit your reserved capacity. I'm not actually able to fulfill these requests. We've run out of computing power. What you can actually do to mitigate that is when you reschedule this workflow, then just do it 
you know, just add in a few seconds, right? Just say, look, I'm gonna space these 10 seconds apart. That just kind of gives the servers a little bit of breathing room. So there's not an exact science to this. It really depends on your own application, but just keep this in mind. These are the types of things that you can do to kind of spread the work more, uh, more evenly uh, across the servers. Now, another thing to keep in mind is right now we're making changes to one user at a time, right? One user is having a change made and then we're looping back around, making changes to the next user and so on and so on and so on. That takes a certain amount of time. Okay, Bubble isn't the best at doing manipulations to a lot of data in a very short amount of time. Okay, If you do need that kind of stuff, look into a service like Zeno. I'll leave a description down below on a really helpful video that was released recently that's talking about the pros and cons, the comparisons between Bubble and Zeno and how they might work together. Um, in your particular use case. But um, another way that you can speed up how fast these loops happen, or rather how fast you can get through a list of objects is by actually making changes to one or two or three or four or five or some larger number of users at a time. So essentially saying make changes to these 10 users and then make changes to these 10. So we're skipping further down the list rather than just going one at a time. And this is something that's been demonstrated by a bubbler called Andrew Vernon. He's posted a really helpful thread on Twitter, which I'll link to in the description as well, on comparing how much faster these workflows can go when you use this kind of setup. But in a nutshell, if you wanted to do something like that in your app, then I'm just gonna copy this expression Let's say we wanted to make changes to two users at a time. This one's making changes to the user at the current index, great. But if I wanna make changes then to, to the next item as well in the list, then what I can do is I can't actually go index here plus one. It's, it's not an expression that Bubble exposes to me. So a little workaround is so if I go arbitrary text, then I can actually add in here that index plus one. This arbitrary text, that's essentially wrapping that index plus one as a text string. So for us to actually use it here in manipulations, mathematical manipulations rather, we need to convert it back to a number. So I'm gonna use this converted to number expression, okay? So what this is doing now, this workflow is, well, this action is taking the current index and this where action is taking the next index, so the next user in that list. So we're making changes to two users every time that we loop through this. And then of course, when we re-trigger this workflow, it's not gonna be index plus one, it's gonna be index plus two, okay? And that's gonna allow us to loop through this list more times. And you can of course add more of these actions as well. So, you know, one for the third item in the list, the fourth item, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing to keep Note here is that for each of these loops, you're now asking the servers to do a lot more work for each loop. So again, you gotta keep an eye on your capacity spikes here and make sure that you're not hitting capacity, but you've got a few different levers that you can pull here to make these go faster. So in a nutshell, those are recursive workflows. They become an indispensable part of your bubbling toolkit if you need to make changes to any list of things that is more than some small finite number, like five items at a time, or do manipulations to a number of different uh, data objects that might have relationships to one another, changing a bunch of fields on, on different objects, um, then that's the type of thing where a recursive workflow that you, where you loop through those list of objects is really gonna be beneficial to you. So hope that's been helpful. Happy bubbling.